I think we're in a we're in a now normal. We've all adjusted to staying at home. We have to get to a new normal, and then we're going to get to what's going to be called a forever normal, in, in my view. And I think we're going to land somewhere different and maybe better. <laughs> David Gilcom here. It's April 28th, 2020, and we're a few months into the COVID-19 pandemic. And here in Rhode Island, we've been under a stringent stay-at-home order for the past 30 days. States across the country are starting to consider when and how to responsibly lift these restrictions. Yesterday, Governor Raimondo released a framework for how to reopen Rhode Island called Reopening Rhode Island, charting the course. It describes three phases of progression, and the metrics we'll monitor to know when we can move from one phase to the next. Today, we're joined by Dr. James McDonald, Medical Director of the Rhode Island Department of Health, to talk about that framework and give a picture of what life might look like over the coming weeks and months, depending on how COVID-19 evolves. What's that humming sound you hear sometimes? Yeah, that's my water heater. I'm podcasting like a gopher from the basement. Welcome to 30,000 Leagues. Dr. McDonald, welcome to the 30,000 Leagues podcast. Oh, David, thank you very much. It's great to be on the podcast with you. States are starting to reopen or starting to think about plans for reopening. And here in Rhode Island, it's almost a month to the day since Governor Raimondo issued the stay-at-home executive order. And then just yesterday, April 27th, she released the reopening Rhode Island charting the course framework. Listeners, you can find this at reopeningri.com. Can you maybe, Dr. Mack, just start us off with, at a high level, kind of laying out what the framework is meant to do, and then I think we can kind of tick through the various phases and metrics we'll look at to know when to move through them afterwards. I think the framework is really meant to look at how do we get back to whatever the new normal looks like. And when I say new normal context, I think we're we're in a now normal. We've all adjusted to staying at home. We have to get to a new normal, and then we're going to get to what's going to be called a forever normal, in my view. And I think we're going to land somewhere different and maybe better. And and I want to say that optimistically and realistically, though. In other words, we went through this pandemic and we're going through this pandemic, but no matter who you are, you know, although some folks have been infected, all folks have been affected. I mean, this pandemic has changed all of us and, and it's changed us forever. There's no way to deny that. So the framework has to focus on how do we keep each other safe? How do we keep our, our economy moving? Um, how do we keep this working so we can still recreate with each other? And it's important to just keep these overarching concepts in place because we do need to interact with each other. We just need to interact with each other differently. And we do need to have jobs and we need to you know, do our economy. We all have to earn our living. But how can we do that safely? And because what we all want to do is, you know, I, I think back to a little bit of how the country was founded. This country was founded on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in some ways, with all the closures, we've kind of interrupted the pursuit of happiness for some, and, and that's been sad. For those who've been isolated or quarantined, we've interrupted their liberty, and that's been very sad too. But what's all been done, these sacrifices have been done to preserve life. And this is one of those things where what we're trying to do is get back to a life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that we can do in a perpetual manner and find out a normal that works. So I think that's a really overarching framework. And maybe before we dip into phase one. Can you remind everybody what the state of play is right now, what the state at home order currently entails? Yeah, the state at home order right now means we really shouldn't be going outside unless you need to go to a doctor's office or get food. And you should go with as few people as possible. A lot of businesses are closed and it's hard to say any business is not essential, but a lot of things have closed, whether it's the barber shop, the hairdresser, a lot of just retail has closed and a lot of it's moved us towards teleworking, by the way. A lot of accountants, lawyers are, are doing telework. Even doctors are, though. I mean, a lot of physicians are doing telehealth now. And, and so really, the stay-at-home is really locked down a lot. What Rhode Island did that, that was different, though, is we didn't stop manufacturing or construction, which other states did. And so far, that's worked out for us. And I think that's important because we needed to keep some of the economy moving. And manufacturing in particular is really important because manufacturers make things that we need. Sometimes it's personal protective equipment for healthcare providers like masks and things like that. Um, And if there's one thing I think we've learned throughout this pandemic is the real importance of manufacturing um, and maybe keeping more of that in our country might be a lesson we learn as a nation. 
And what's been the impact of the stay at home order so far? A lot of unemployment has been one issue, uh, which is not a good thing. You know, our unemployment rate is, is, is significant. And that's, that's not a minor thing. You know, one of the things about all of us is I, I hope you find a job someday that you're passionate and purpose about and have a purpose to because passion and purpose in your employment is phenomenally important. Um, but quite frankly, a lot of us just need the, the income to live. And unemployment only goes so far. So that's one negative of this. On the other hand, one positive about this is we're seeing a lot of decreases in disease. Although COVID is still a big concern, um, flu went away uh, for the most part. Other viruses are down. Um, so we're seeing some, some short-term health benefits as well. And I think that's just a good example of one extreme and the other extreme. And, and I think part of it is the hospitals haven't been overwhelmed. You know, Some of the models we looked at early in this showed us really exceeding capacity um, of all the hospitals, plus all the field hospitals we're building. And that was a frightening time for us um, to feel like we'd be in a situation like Italy was, where there was no hospital bed or no ventilator. I mean, that's, that's a preventable death, and that's a hard thing to swallow. So there's been a substantial sacrifice in our state. Um, but right now, we're seeing, at least in my view, that was, that's worth it because we're, we're not overwhelming the hospitals, and our healthcare system is still functioning. I mean, we're, we're in a very envious position, I think, about how do we now bring in elective surgery? In other words, how do we take advantage of all the hard work everybody did and all the sacrifice folks did and then move towards a position of actually getting back to a normal healthcare economy and then a normal economy otherwise? The next phase or phase one, what in the report gets referred to as, as testing the water, slated for as soon as 12 days from now, May 9th. What should we be expecting is potentially going to be lifted at that moment? So you're going to see some business activity on a really limited basis. And that's going to be very minor things that are going to change. It's not going to look incredibly different, uh, but it's going to be starting in some concepts. Like you might see limited um, daycares, maybe, maybe, you, you know, a daycare with 10 kids per grouping would be allowed. There might be some other small things, you know, like what does it look like for some dental offices to reopen doing urgent or emergent care only? What does that look like? And then, you know, are there other avenues to the economy that can be open on a very limited basis? You know, schools already closed for the rest of the year, um, but you're going to see these small um, limitations that are going to move in that direction, and we'll see what's going to happen there. And I think that's a very responsible way of just testing the water because you get to move in that direction, but what we get to see is what does it look like for our case counts? And one of the things that is important is as we see new cases, during all this time, we've built the infrastructure to isolate and quarantine. Um, and, and that's a really important thing to do because as we still do our case finding, that public health intervention of case finding, when you isolate and quarantine, isolate the ill, quarantine exposed, we really do minimize the spread of this untreatable disease right now. And when we're talking about testing particular places, even something like opening a few childcare facilities with 10 or less or something like that. Are you envisioning that these would be kind of across the board? You know, if you're a child care center that can keep groups at 10 or less, then you're eligible to do this? Or is it even tighter testing still? If we're going to pick, you know, three child care facilities, open them a little bit, see what happens, and then spread further. Yeah, my understanding of the plan is it's a limited um, launch of this right now um, to kind of really test the waters. Now, I don't think the names were chosen um, by accident, because you really do have to kind of, you know, test the waters a little bit. You know, just to underscore a concept, this, this is a new disease. So we've had to learn as we're going here. Um, and I think that's one of the key things about this particular pandemic. It's a new disease. You know, some of the concepts we know from previous diseases help us, but we have to be very, very cognizant that we have to respect that it's a new disease and learn as we go. So to some degree, you know, soft launches of things make more sense to me. Uh, so we can react and then respond because you know we really don't want to let this get out of hand again we have to shut everything down that would not be good for anybody how will you select which places to open in the testing phase yeah i'm, I'm not sure i know the answer to that because it's a large group of people who are making that decision so um, I, I think it's going to be more strategic and in, in what makes the most sense when we enter the phase what are the metrics that you're going to start looking at very closely to see if the lift is going the way you want or if things are maybe not going the way you want? Yeah, so there's six key indicators that are really important. 
Um, and these six key indicators, the first key indicator is, has the rate of the spread continued to decrease? In other words, what's our case count look like every day? Are we doing enough testing? What's the hospitalization number look like? And then we have to keep track of deaths as well. And so that's one indicator. The second one is, you know, do we have the capacity to quickly identify community spread in an ongoing basis before the major outbreak occurs? In other words, can we lock down that? And that infrastructure has been built where we can find outbreaks. So that's important to do that sentinel surveillance. The third indicator is, hey, do we have the necessary supports in place for vulnerable populations and anyone in quarantine? And, and this is a very important concept in Rhode Island. We're really big on health equity zones, really big on health for everybody. It shouldn't matter what zip code you live in, what your health outcome looks like. And that infrastructure exists. And the other, the other indicator number four is, what about personal protective equipment? Do we have enough? Um, you know, one of the key limitations in this pandemic was we started without enough personal protective equipment, and that was not optimal at all. We got through, and we're getting more right now, and lately I've seen success with that, but this was a real national limitation here on the PPE. The fifth indicator is hey, how are our businesses, schools, child care sites, faith organizations, and recreational spaces, do they have a plan to operationalize in a new normal? Can they do long-term social distancing? And this is a good example of everybody has to get on the same page. In other words, our new normal isn't going back to handshake, hugging. It's really about social distancing and learning new ways of interacting with each other. Um, so we do things like that. And then the sixth indicator is, hey, are we prepared to reimpose measures or reclose certain sectors of our economy if it becomes necessary? And, and this is an important concept as well. I mean, one of the things we have to realize going in is what's, what's your corporate value, if you will? And I think it's still about preserving life. You know, it's about reducing mortality and reducing morbidity. Um, and these are key concepts that are just critical. Because if, if you think about, you know, part of our job as, as the health department is, our, our job is one, to protect the public, and two, to keep you healthy. Those are really important jobs that we have to do here. And these are things that we're doing with all of government right now, um, which has been a welcome addition here. Let's, let's loop back each of those with just a few more questions on the details, starting with that metric of the rate of spread, looking for 14 days decrease in the number of cases or stable and declining hospitalizations. Why 14 days? Yeah, that has a lot to do with the incubation period. And one of the things about this virus, one of the reasons why this virus was successful creating a pandemic was its incubation period. In other words, the time between you were exposed and you got sick is either two to 14 days. And that's different than other viruses. So in other words, you, you may not remember who you were exposed to 14 days ago. I sure don't. Um, that's why it's important to keep track of who you're around so you can keep a little logbook of that. The governor keeps reminding people that, but I think that's really important. But part of why that 14 day number is important is, and this is again, just why the pandemic is so hard to manage is, an intervention you do um, today may not really show an impact for more than 14 days. And that's important because especially in the culture we're living we're used to, you know, you do something and you see a change in microseconds. We're not used to waiting three weeks to see an impact of something. And that's part of why that limitation is so important. So that's why it brings it back to 14 days is a good length of time to get a sense of what a trend looks like. And is another component here that's going to be considered just evolving understanding of the virus itself? You know, if it turns out that the fatality rate or other features is just as less serious than we think. Is that another component? You know, there's a lot of questions I have about this virus. And I think one of the reasons I kind of mentioned earlier, it's only been around for 121 days, is there's still much we don't know about the virus. You know, I have questions about the virus, and I think a lot of people do. You know, I don't know if we're going to have long-lasting immunity. And I think that's an important point to get out there is, and by the way, there's the SARS virus, the original SARS virus, we're dealing with SARS-CoV-2, but SARS virus didn't give people long-lasting immunity. And most coronaviruses and, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a coronavirus, don't give you lifelong immunity. That's why some people get, you know, the common cold every year. So one question I have is, gee, are we going to have long-lasting immunity? The other question I wonder about is, you know, the more the virus propagates, the more people get infected. Is, is it going to mutate to something that's even worse? So I, I don't know what that looks like. And I don't mean to sound like that's something I'm worried about, but that's something I'm worried about. Uh, because if the virus were to mutate, 
Um, that's something we have to be careful about. And you know, I don't take for granted we're gonna have a vaccine. Um, I'm glad people are working on a vaccine, but that's something that we don't know if we have one yet. And, and I don't take for granted we're gonna find a treatment either. And I don't, you know, I don't know if you know this, but we haven't treated the common cold all that successfully. And we've been looking, you know? Um, but granted, a lot of people are looking a lot harder right now for treatment, so that's important. And the other question I have, that's a big question is, what about the whole pediatric experience? I mean, in kids right now, very few kids have been affected. About 5% of our total cases in Rhode Island are kids, and only 1% are kids zero to nine years of age. So we don't know what this means. I mean, I don't know why kids aren't getting as infected as much, or we just aren't finding them. Uh, part of it could be it's so mild in kids that we're just not finding them, but we don't know what the implications are. You know, I'm a pediatrician when I'm not doing this. You know, I'm board certified in preventive medicine and pediatrics. One of the things about children I've learned though is they don't always behave like adults. And sometimes, you know, what happens in kids rarely um, isn't very, very good. And so one of the things I'm keeping my mind open to, are there rare uh, significant things that happen to kids we just don't know about yet? So part of what I'm just saying is there's a lot of questions about this and, and it's important to have that context on it because as we look at reopening and as we look at managing the pandemic, you know, I'm, a public health expert, but I'm still learning about this pandemic. We're all learning about it together. Uh, but I think having an open mind and a willing spirit uh, leads to the acquisition of knowledge and a bit of wisdom. The second metric around the capacity to quickly identify community spread, it's got specific details like the ability to test symptomatic individuals within 48 to 72 hours, access to testing, particularly for those disproportionately impacted, contact tracing within 24 hours. Why is this really vigorous testing and follow-up so critical to the framework? Yeah, it gets back to this notion of case finding. In other words, this public health intervention of case finding is, we do want to find folks who are sick because in the absence of a vaccine or treatment, the best intervention I have right now is to isolate the ill and quarantine the exposed. And it's interesting, these are you know, from the 1100s. Quarantine is a technique that's been around since the 1100s. Um, it, but it's, it's not new, but it still seems to be our most effective strategy. And the reality of it is, we have to be able to do this rapidly and we have to be able to do it effectively. You have to do it for everybody. It just can't be for those who want it. And I think one of the things we're really seeing in this pandemic is, you know, some of the societal problems we have, the social problems we have, like people who experience homelessness and people of um, challenging socioeconomic status where their living conditions aren't optimal. These are really magnified during this time. And I think one of the things we're starting to see as a culture, regardless of your political viewpoint on life, is it's in everyone's best interest to solve these large problems. Um, it's not just the right thing to do. It's in everyone's best interest, but it's still the right thing to do. We got to find a way to solve other people's problems. And I think if anything about this pandemic, it's reminding us as much as Americans were rugged individualists, we have to be other oriented as well um, because it just gets us to that larger, better place. How close are we right now to having this type of sort of surveillance capacity in place? Yeah, I think we're pretty close. In other words, I see right now our testing capacity is, you know, dramatically improved. I mean, the governor made what sounded like an outlandish promise that we could go into a thousand tests a day. And now we're easily doing 2,400 tests a day. And, you know, last week, but a day we did over 3000 tests a day. And I, I think we're heading towards even more and more testing. And, and part of that was from the national supply chain interruptions. Like we had to work, you know, it's interesting. We really was like competing against 49 other states to find specimen collection kits. I mean, it was great to have Amgen, a pharmaceutical company in our state as a partner because they were able to help us make these specimen collection kits. But it was really helpful just to find testing capacity and, and to solve some of these other issues. And the national supply chain issues were, were and still are problematic, but they're getting better. Uh, the PPE acquisition, the masks is getting better. But this is one of those things where that gives us a little more confidence as we move forward in the pandemic is, as we start solving our supply chain issues, it makes the national and local responses to the pandemic a little bit better. And you know, it's interesting in the beginning, I was a bit surprised when we went to the strategic national stockpile, you know, we got 25% of our, our, our stockpile, but we, we never got the other 75%. And David, you know, it's interesting. People might say, well, did the country get caught with their pants down? Well, I would submit they weren't even wearing pants. I mean, 
what happened that the strategic national stockpile wasn't stocked? And that's why you have a stockpile to stock it. And what happened nationally that we were okay for decades making decisions that we didn't need to buy the stuff? You know, and, and those are tough political decisions. I'm not saying I would have been better at this, but what I'm saying is, oh my, if we don't learn from past mistakes, we are doomed to repeat it. And I think it's imperative that as a people, we recognize that we need to be better prepared in the future because we, we have to learn from these mistakes. We just do. And there's two types of testing that are expanding. Testing for those who have symptoms or are otherwise sort of seeking out the testing for a particular reason. There's also mention of introducing more random sample testing. So, you know, asking people to get tested, even if they don't have a symptom. Why is that latter type of random sample testing important? Yeah, so one principle we talked about was case funding. The other principle is something called surveillance. So surveillance is when we purposely look for asymptomatic people and see if they're carrying uh, the virus. And sometimes asymptomatic are actually pre-symptomatic. In other words, you're gonna get sick in a few days. Like one of the things we've noticed is we do more and more nursing home testing, not just of the residents, but of the staff. Or one of the things, you know, we get to a nursing home with cases, we test the staff and all the residents is, we've noticed there's staff who were carrying the virus. Now, they didn't feel sick at all. Um, but then they might feel sick a few days later or might not. Um, but this is why surveillance is really important of the asymptomatic or even the pre-symptomatic. You know, this reminds me of that axiom in medicine, what you don't know you don't know can hurt your patient. Um, and it's important to, in my est estimation, know what you don't know. And if you don't know how many people are carrying the virus, you need to know that. And this is why expanded testing was so important. And it, it needs to get more normal, by the way. Like we need to get away from, as awesome as the National Guard has been, and we, Lord knows where we'd be without them, which is a terrible place. The National Guard's been awesome. It's, it's not sustainable for a state to have the National Guard running 10 sites. So we need to find a way to get the testing specimen collection back to the normal everyday practice of outpatient medicine. In other words, people going to their doctor and having a specimen collected safely, and then that specimen sent to a lab um, and, and that's the system we're working towards where that will return normal. And I don't know exactly when that part of the system will get back, please, because I think, I know the National Guard's going to be with us for a while. I know the CBS is going to be with us for a while. And they've both been really good partners, very helpful. Uh, but the plan is to get this back to the normal practice of medicine. And with the random sample or surveillance testing, you know, if you could wave a wand and today have every Rhode Islander get tested, what's a what result would you hope for here? Because I could imagine a world in which if it turns out that lots more people actually have the virus but aren't showing symptoms, you might process that as a somewhat good thing. You would if it meant you got immunity. And since we don't know if you have immunity, I'm not sure it answers a meaningful question yet. Uh, so a probably more sensible way of doing this is targeted testing. And when I say targeted, finding a random sample uh, throughout the state to get an idea of your prevalence. Prevalence is, well, gee, quite frankly, over a period of time, how many cases have we had um, or how many do we actually have at the moment um, is more like your incidence. And the, the difference between incidence and prevalence is important. Um, on the other hand, when you're dealing with such a short time frame, like in our state where we've only been dealing with sort of 59 days, the bottom line is we just need to know how many people have had this disease so far. But since we don't know if they have immunity or long-term immunity at that, we still have to answer that question. Um, because if we knew people acquired long-term immunity, um, it would really change our decision. That's where, you know, if we get a vaccine, we hope a vaccine will confer long-term immunity. Uh, but that's still something we have to discover, right? One, discover if we can create a vaccine. Two, will it provide long-term immunity? You know, with the flu vaccine, why do we create a new flu, flu vaccine every year? We create a new flu vaccine every year because the flu changes every year. And that's just an important planning assumption. We know the flu changes every year, so we change our vaccine. We don't know what the COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is going to do yet because it's still new to us. We have to learn. And does this framework assume that we will develop immunity or that we don't? This framework assumes we may not develop immunity because that is the most logical planning assumption um, because you, you, can't, you can't plan for the best and then just deal with the worst. You have to do the opposite. You have to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And that's what the framework addresses. And if we don't have immunity, is the implication primary that we'll have to keep restrictions in place for, well, I guess until, until what? Until we have a vaccine? 
You know, if we don't have immunity, we have to find a way to live with the disease. And I think that's where the plan is heading towards. And that's where concepts like isolating the ill, quarantine the exposed, that might be part of our life for a while. And that's something that might be something we have to just get used to here. I, I think other things is we might have to look at how do we do things differently? Can virtual business be more of our business um, is a way to do this. In other words, can we interact meaningfully, but less personally and in-person visit, you know what I mean? And I think part of it gets to, as we transact business in retail outlets, it's not bothering me that I'm six feet away from the person in front of me. It's not bothering me that I'm going into a store wearing a mask. These are things that are gonna be meaningful strategies. And I would like to get to a place where everybody had better masks. You know, I think the cloth masks are good for now, but we might get to a place where everybody starts wearing surgical masks because they're generally higher quality. Um, and as the supply chain improves, that'd be better. I definitely want to get closer to surgical masks for our critical infrastructure workers. I think that's important, getting surgical masks for our critical infrastructure workers, um, because as they work in factories and manufacturing, this is important. But there's things that are going to be part of this normalcy that I think we're just going to adjust to, because we have to find a way to live with the virus without closing down our economy, because we need that to live. How close are we to understanding whether we do develop immunity? It's just going to take time. And, and the reason why I say it is, keep in mind, it's hard for me to tell you how people have immunity if they're six months off from the disease, because no one on the planet is six months off from the disease. And one of the things that we haven't seen a lot of just yet is people getting the disease twice. So the longer time elapses, and we know people aren't getting the disease twice or more, then that's an encouraging sign here. One of the things that's nice about the case finding is we know who got the disease. So if we know who's had the disease, then we have a great idea of knowing who got it in the future. This is also part of why the serology testing will be important, because as you follow people longitudinally over time, you can get a sense of what was this, you know? Now, keep in mind, if the, if the virus were to mutate, this does challenge our, our future, because maybe it's like, well, you had immunity, but then we have a new strain of the virus. Um, and it just depends how serious it is. And, that, and I get to that, I mean the morbidity and mortality rate. Because right? part of why this virus was successful causing a pandemic was, you know, if it was just a minor cold and nobody died from it, we wouldn't be nearly as concerned. What was interesting about this virus that made it successful was it actually had a pretty substantial mortality rate, somewhere in the order of 2% in China is what we saw. The mortality rate in the United States seems less. I think that's because we're doing a little better at case finding, um, but it's still a higher mortality rate than influenza, so it's substantial. Um, but its transmission is, is more than influenza. In other words, it's a much easier virus to catch than influenza. And that transmissibility is what made it a successful uh, virus to be a pandemic creator. It's, it's the combination of transmissibility was greater and the mortality was greater, so it got our attention. The third metric is necessary supports for vulnerable and in quarantine. What are those unique needs and how close are we to having those supports in place here in Rhode Island? Yeah, housing is one of the biggest needs. In other words, where do people go? Because uh, quite frankly, everybody needs a place to be. Um, so that, uh, that's been you know, developed and that, that's important. Um, there's, that infrastructure is operationalized and that's moving in the direction. The vulnerable populations is, you know, one, we've done some nice work at identifying them. We have more to do in that space. And we have more to do of getting messages to the vulnerable populations because language barriers are issues. We have to overcome those things, but I see progress in that space. And then recognizing where our vulnerable patients are. Vulnerable people are all over, uh, but sometimes it's the workplace that made them vulnerable. If you're a critical infrastructure worker and you're too close to the other person or you don't have a mask, that's problematic. And, and some of our lower paying healthcare positions make people more vulnerable as well. And part of the reason the nursing home issue was the nursing home issue was they had staffing issues to begin with. And, you know, they were barely staffing some nursing homes to begin with through the pandemic and it just exacerbated an extent problem. The fourth metric is having enough healthcare facilities, personal protective equipment in place to handle a, a surge. What's that look like and how close are we to being in the right position for handling another surge if it happened. Yeah, ju just in the last week, we, we've done better at getting face shields and surgical masks. We're still short N95s, those respirators healthcare providers use during 
um, aerosolizing procedures. So we have some, but we need more. And we, we just got in some gowns. We're still starting with gowns, but we just found um, a reliable source for that. And gloves were a challenge, but we got some help with that there. Uh, but this gets those national supply chain issues. Um, I think underscores the importance for us just to look at manufacturing a little bit differently. I think we need to be strategic about what we make and where we make it. Because quite frankly, we can't always outsource our life. We have to look at ways to bring manufacturing locally and, and sort of find a way to, to make it optimized for that. And I, you know, to me, I think a lot of us have got a great deal more respect for the power of manufacturing and why it's so important to us. Because quite frankly, I can't make stuff. I can think about stuff, but I don't make anything. Um, and I think one of the things that's really apparent to all of us is we need the people who make stuff for us. And we need to honor them as who they are and why they're so important in our culture. Um, because, you know, tell you, even a simple object, like I got a glass over here I'm drinking water out of, I know how to make a glass. There's a, you know, a computer here. I can't make a computer. But even simple things like a face mask, I don't even know how to sew, you know, Dave. I don't, I don't, know, how to, I don't know how to do stuff like that. And it's because like I don't know how to do anything. But the bottom line is, you think really underscores the concept like we are interdependent. You know that third grade concept you learn called interdependence? If there's one thing the pandemic has taught us is we need each other. And I think the service I provide as a physician is valuable. Um, but I recognize there's services that others provide that is very critical to our survival. Um, and if I don't have that grocery store person stocking those fruits and vegetables, then I'm not getting my five servings of fruits or vegetables every day. Um, and if that gas station doesn't have gas to sell, my car isn't going anywhere. Um, and so the interdependence that we are recognizing, if we can recognize that and value that, I think it honors everyone in this thing. And that could be a virtue that we come to collectively where we get a greater respect for the power that each of us brings to our own lives, not just our economy, but our livelihood. In other words, we don't survive without the grocery store produce clerk. Um, and, and we don't survive with the people who, who make our clothing. We need everyone to make our stuff. So this is just some of the stuff that we're learning from this. The, the fifth metric are businesses, schools, childcare facilities, faith organizations, rec spaces, having long-term social distancing plans in place. What, 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 does, that, what does that really mean? You know, if I, if I own a childcare center right now and I see that, is there sort of a, a document I'm supposed to be writing up and submitting to the state or something different? So we're giving guidance to folks as best we can on this, um, but it, it's going to be something that's like, how many people are allowed in a, in a common space? What does it look like if you're a restaurant? How many tables can be in there? And that's going to look different than what it did in the past. What does outdoor eating look like? And, and part of it gets to, as you look at settings, is we're used to being close to each other. And we, we, we recognize being close to each other as part of our past, but I don't know that being part of our near future. And, you know, I, I kind of use the expression, we have to keep each other at arm's length. You know, if you put both arms out, there should be a little bit of a gap between you and the next person. And, and part of what I'm getting at is keeping each other at arm's length physically doesn't mean arm's length emotionally, right? We're still going to connect with each other, have warm conversations, develop strong feelings and intimacy and affection. But it, it's going to be done in a way that's different for us. And, and part of the concept for the economy to function, when I go to the store, I got to be six feet away from other customers. And you know, one of the things you see at the Walmart in the Whole Foods, wherever you shop for your, for your groceries is they got arrows on how you're supposed to walk throughout the store. It's little things like this that will matter. And you know, it's kind of a bummer. I can't bring my bags into the store anymore because I like that recycling aspect. Um, but I get it. We don't want to have common objects from other people's houses bringing in viruses into our place. So I get that. But some of that will be developing. What does new normal look like for us? How do we manage in our future? And what about for schools in particular? What do you think the reentry into opening schools is going to likely look like and when? It, it, so I don't know when, and I'm not sure anyone does, quite frankly. Um, and I think it might look different. Like, and it might start raising questions about, do we all go to school every day or do we go, we break that up? Um, how, what's the size of a classroom um, in the future look like? That has to be figured out. Um, and is there a mixture of distance learning and in-person learning and how does that look? And is that even better in some ways? Um, but how do we plan for that? And I think these are larger questions we have, to, we have to answer. If the virus goes much lower, it changes our planning assumptions. Like in other words, if we get the number of people infected much less, then we can change a little bit how we do it. One of the big concepts though that we have to keep in mind is 
this whole notion of showing up all over your life sick has to stop. In other words, if you want to go to work sick, you have to just stop doing that. If you want to go to Walmart with a cold, you can't do that anymore either, um, which makes me think there'll be more delivery in our economy of the future and more services brought to someone's home. Um, but this notion of just, you know, and I think all of us were like this, like who in the past would have a cold would sit in their house for a week? I would submit nobody. You would go to work and just like, yeah, I got a cold. Who cares? Well, it turns out now it matters quite a bit. And I think one of the lessons we've learned from this is you have to take days off when you're sick, but that gets that large issue of like, if I don't have sick time, what am I going to do? Cause I got to feed my family. I just can't take two weeks off and not get paid. And I think this is really important to have that national conversation about what about sick time for everybody, you know, and how does that work? And that came out of the CARES Act. Everybody got 10 days of sick time, but <clears throat> can that be made perpetual? I know that's expensive, um, but I think one of the things we're seeing is if we don't buy planned things, we're getting hit with unplanned expenses that we just, can't, quite frankly, can't afford. And the sixth and final metric is to be prepared to reimpose restrictions if we have to. What does that mean? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a hard one to read, isn't it? Because I think what it really means is we have to value preserving life over everything else, guys. And I think the hard truth of that is we have to recognize that if we didn't do a very good job at some part of this, we have to reimpose restrictions. And one of the things that might happen though is targeted closures. In other words, if we saw an outbreak in one part of the state, maybe the targeted closures would just be there, but then we'd have to trust folks not to drive all over the state to do things. Um, and that's part of why you deal with this you know, pandemic in Rhode Island, but it's also, we're influenced by Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, and the other neighboring states. Um, so that's why there's a bit of a regional conversation here. And I think it just speaks to, if there's one thing I see the pandemic happening for us is more conversation about how we're gonna behave in the future, personally, in small groups, and in large groups. We just, it's part of our life now. So on May 9th, we're gonna start in a very targeted way, lifting some restrictions to test the waters. We're gonna be looking for those 14 day decreases or stabilizations in cases and hospitalizations. A lot of case management and surveillance to quickly identify community spread, supports for the vulnerable and in quarantine, making sure we've got the right healthcare facilities, personal protective equipment, social distancing plans and businesses, schools, child care centers, and preparing ourselves for the possibility of having to reimpose restrictions. If things are looking good on all of these fronts, can you take us through the, the final stretch in terms of what phase two and phase three looks like? Yeah, so it, this is one of those things where it's going to be waiting and see how we get to navigating our way. Phase two is navigating our way. And that's where, as we open more, we look at what's the new business models that work. And I think the Department of Business Regulation has been doing a lot of proactive work with that. I've seen Secretary Pryor is doing a lot of exciting stuff. And then I, I think we're going to look at what phase three looks like, that picking up speed approach, where we're going to have new guidelines with more and more businesses open. There might be some travel restrictions, but we're going to see what that looks like. And, I, and I, the ultimate destination is to try to land in a place where we're better and stronger than we were in the past. And, it, and at a minimum, we'd be more resilient. And you know, resiliency means bad things happen, we respond and we, we recover, you know? And I think that flexibility is gonna be important here. Um, so time will tell what this looks like, but it's gonna be adaptive, it's gonna be measurable, and we're gonna do it transparently. And, and you know, if nothing else, what I think Rhode Island and beyond should know is that we're doing this together. We're learning together, but we're planning together and we're talking about it together. Um, so, you know, you've got a great chance to be at least informed and part of the process. Governor Raimondo does a press briefing at one o'clock every day. How do you all decide what to cover and prepare for that moment? Yeah, it's the governor's communication team who does that. And it's a little bit like planning a one hour TV show every day. I'm, I'm amazed at how much they do it. Um, it. It's amazing to me how well they put that together. You know, our part is pretty clear over here at the Department of Health. What we're trying to do is look at what happened in the state that day that was relevant. You know, we get a lot of questions from reporters the day before, and we're trying to keep ahead of what the message is. Um, and, and so what we look at is what's going on in real time and then what needs to be out there for the public, what's beneficial. Like, I've been substituting for the director on Sundays, and last Sunday, one of the things I needed to address was I saw some data that showed our immunization rates in children were dropping. Um, and so, you know, when I looked at last March compared to this March, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine was down 39%. Now that's not a big problem because we have herd immunity for that. 
But if that keeps going month after month, we're going to have a big problem. And, and managing a pandemic is challenging. But if I have to manage a measles outbreak at the same time, that's going to make it even more difficult. So what I looked at for that was what was relevant and what could I communicate in that forum? And, and part of the reason I say it that way, David, is, you know, one of the things we have right now is we have a pulpit to preach from every day at one o'clock. We have a chance to get out important public health messages. So we seize that opportunity for what's the most relevant data for that day. If you're a listener who wants to learn more about reopening Rhode Island or has ideas on how to do this, any recommendations on what they should read next to, who they should reach out to? You know, I, I think the website you gave earlier uh, is really the right place to go. You're talking about reopeningri.com? It's the one that makes the most sense to me. The health department's got a lot of great information that, about the website, about, about the whole pandemic. If you want to just go to health.ri.gov, it's a great place to start and learn about what's going on. Uh, you know, and I do encourage people to be involved. You know, one of the things I'll just say is that have a voice and, and speak, speak your truth. I mean, the reality of it is dissenting opinions are welcome. This is America. We opine together. Part of the way we learn is we, we offer different opinions. And, and the bottom line I'm getting is iron sharpens iron, my friends. Um, let us work together towards a common good. That's what we're all trying to put together here. Dr. McDonald, I really appreciate you joining today. Hey, thank you. It was fun spending some time with you this morning. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for listening to 30,000 Leagues, our podcast from the Policy Lab. This episode was hosted by David Yoakum and produced by David in his basement with some finishing touches from Ben Gu and Delphine. You can find more conversations at 30,000leagues.com or by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. I had to just send my two young boys up further up the stairs so they weren't a part of this podcast. We got a two and a four year old. Hey. Oh, good for you. How fun. How fun. Yeah, it's uh it's something. And then say, don't touch it. Say, welcome to 30,000 Leagues. Welcome to 40,000 Weeks. <laughs> 40,000 Weeks. That's how long I feel like we've been in the lockdown. <laughs>